to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 1. We welcome you today to our study of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation kind of takes two spectrums in people's mind. Either they are so afraid of studying it because they've had difficulty with the images and the pictures that they very rarely read it, or Revelation has kind of become a launching pad for a lot of far-fetched ideas that just aren't really taught in the Bible. And so in our study today, we want to look at identifying how the revelation of Jesus Christ Christ is to be read and studied and hopefully set some principles out that will help us to study this very encouraging book. And so we're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. We hope that you'll get your Bible. Have it open to the book of Revelation and ready as we're going to study the Word of God together. And if you don't have your Bible, please locate it and have it handy as we study together today. Friend, we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual members and congregations of the Church of Christ. We'd love to encourage you to check out the Lord's Church in your area. You'll find people at the Lord's Church who love God, who love the Bible, who are concerned about lost souls, and we want to encourage you to visit their assembly and study with them as it relates to the Word of God. In fact, if you've got a, a Bible question, maybe you'd like to know more about salvation or the church or what must I do to be saved or why we worship the way we do. Friend, there'll be people there who'll be glad to sit down and study the Word of God with you. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your, in your desire to know God's Word better. Uh, won't you check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com? From it, you can locate all of our lessons archived online. We have lessons on every book of the Bible, a wide variety of topics, over 500 lessons available to you, all free of charge to help us grow in our knowledge of God's Word. Don't forget also to check out our app that is located on the Android and Apple Play Stores. That's a great way to study the Word of God on the go. And so any way we can help you. If you'd like to have a copy of any of our lessons, you can call us or write to us. Go to our website, fill out a media request form. We make that available to you free of charge. We'll even pay the postage to get that there to you. Today we're thinking about the book of Revelation. And this book indeed is unique and a little different than the other 26 books in the New Testament in that its language is very vivid, very graphic, meant to make an impression upon the reader, not necessarily meant to be picked apart and every detail analyzed per se. And so the, today, as we introduce the book, for a couple of lessons, we want to offer some keys, seven keys to unlock the book of Revelation that will help us to understand its message as God intended it. But friend, before we do that, let's realize that the Bible is designed to help us know God, help us get to heaven, and to encourage us along that journey. The book of Revelation is no different. Its design is to help us know about God, help us know more about heaven and how to get there and encourage us along that journey as well. This is not a book that is written with some mystic code where you've got to turn it upside down and read it backwards as it were and some kind of mystic feature is going to jump. No, that's not the idea. Revelation is meant to be read and understood, although we might have to approach it just a little differently. And so the first key 
To understand the book of Revelation is this. Revelation clearly teaches us, and these keys we're going to offer are going to come right out of the book of Revelation. Revelation tells us, first off, right from the outset, that it is a book written in signs and symbols. I want you to get your Bible out and look at the very first verse of Revelation. Notice Revelation chapter 1, verse number 1 with me. The Bible says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave Him to show His servants things which must shortly take place, and He sent and signified it by His angel to His servant John. And so John is on the Isle of Patmos. He has been exiled there for his beliefs in Jesus Christ and for his faith. And while there, God's angel reveals this message to him. But listen to these words again. He sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. There are two important words here that we want to put our attention toward from the outset. The word revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the word revelation means to unveil or uncover. Something that had been covered, something that had been not known, is now going to be made known. It's going to be left wide open, uh, unveiled, so that we can understand what's being spoken about. And then there is the word signified. He sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. The word signified literally means to show something in signs and in symbols. And friend, as you read the book of Revelation, there's a lot of very impressive and memorable signs and symbols. For example, as you read the book of Revelation, you're going to be introduced to a, a dragon. You're going to be introduced to a, a sea beast and a land beast and, and people are being caused to worship these images that are made by, the, by these beasts. These are, are graphic images that impress upon our mind a very vivid picture in this book. You're going to see a harlot with the, a, holding a, a cup of blood that has the saints in it, drinking from that, and she's riding on the back of this beast with uh, seven heads and ten horns on each head. That's such a graphic image that is seen in the book of Revelation. You, th you talk about images that jump out at us. You've got the four horsemen that you think of, and each one represents some kind of disaster that's going to unfold. In the book of Revelation, we see Jesus riding on a white horse, dressed triumphantly as a king, and, and he's got a, a sword coming out of his mouth. All of these images are designed to impress a point to our mind, impress an idea on our heart that we won't soon forget. And so Revelation is what we call an example of apocalyptic literature. Deuteronomy 29 verse 29, an apocalypsis or an apocalypsis is an unveiling. Something has been hidden, something is maybe cryptic as it were, and that now is going to be unveiled and made known. Deuteronomy 29 verse 29 tells us the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things which He has revealed belong to us and our children. Now, someone says, okay, that's all good and well, and I see where Revelation 1-1 says it's going to be written in signs and symbols, but why would God do that? Well, friend, this type of writing, there's two twofold reason here, this type of writing was designed to reveal the message to some while veiling it to others. Let's back up. As we think about John receiving this message, John is going to send it to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And those congregations are suffering greatly at the hand of an evil, ungodly government. And John needs to get them a message of hope, a message of comfort, a message that God and His kingdom and His church is going to be victorious without bringing more suffering and harm to these Christians. And so he writes in an apocalyptic type of language where the message is designed to reveal the truth to some while others might not think it's anything to be taken seriously. In fact, 
many of these images, most of, if not all the images that you will find in the book of Revelation have a reference to something in the Old Testament. And when that reader hears that, when he hears about the, the 24 priests, Naturally, he's going to think about to the priesthood of Israel and the people around God's throne. When he thinks about uh, the, the, the dragon, the sea beast and the land beast, can't help but think of Behemoth and Leviathan from the book of Job. You can, all these images are familiar to many of the Jewish readers and they would convey a, convey a graphic idea of truth to them. And so it is the same today. These images ought to convey a message to us as we familiarize ourselves with God's truth in the Bible. Now friend, let's also think about this. As we consider Revelation being written in symbols, part of these symbols is the use of symbolic numbers. Numbers contained a key meaning to people both in the Old and the New Testament, and we need to familiarize ourselves with those numbers. For example, the number three came to represent God or deity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and thus three is often associated with deity. The number four often represents the earth. You've got the four directions, north, south, east, and west, and thus it came to represent the earth. Seven is kind of the complete or the perfect number. You've got God's earth that He created. You've got God. You've got the idea of seven being combined there, and thus it is complete perfection, absolute is the idea. Thus, when you hear the number six, it's one, one short of seven. Six came to represent imperfect, incomplete. And thus, when we hear that emphatic statement, 666, it's just the repetition of imperfection is the idea. Uh, uh, Twelve came to represent humanity or God's people. And you can see the clear Old Testament association with that, right? How many tribes were there in Israel? You've got the 12 tribes. 12 came to represent humanity or God's people. The number 1,000. 1,000 is often an indefinite period of time, usually with a, a definite end in sight. And so when we hear about the thousand years of tribulation, we're talking about an indefinite period of time, not necessarily down to 999 days, 23 hours and 59 minutes. Now we can say that that's not the idea. It's more of a, an indefinite period of time. No one really knows the exact idea, but it has a definite end coming inside. And so helping to familiarize ourselves with these numbers will also help in understanding the book of Revelation. Thus, when I hear about seven of something, that's a complete idea. When I hear about three and a half, that's an indefinite time period, thousand years. Uh, again, all that is unique in its use of numerology in the Bible. And so the first key, and this is a big one, to unlock the book of Revelation, God tells us in the very first verse, Revelation is written in symbols. Those symbols are not to be picked apart literally. Is there literally a harlot riding on the back of a, a beast that has seven heads and every head has ten horns? And is she literally holding a chalice with the blood of the saints and drinking that? No, that's not the idea. But that is such a graphic image. When I understand who those characters are, I understand what God's getting across. Rome. Her government and the evil government that day is reaping great harm on God's people. And throughout the book of Revelation, God is telling them, hang on a little while. I'm going to avenge your blood and there's something better waiting for you. And so I need to realize these symbols are unique and they impress an idea upon our minds. Secondly, a big, big key to understanding the book of Revelation, and this is one, that so many people miss. The book of Revelation itself tells us, God tells us, Revelation is written primarily about things that would happen in a short time period that the readers knew about. Now, let me state that another way. When the Christians in the, in the first century, this is a, uh, the book of Revelation is written to Christians in Asia Minor, and what I learned from that, I learned by application and implication. 
Revelation is written with a short time frame in mind and it applied directly to those Christians. Let's illustrate that. Open your Bible with me to Revelation chapter 1. We're going to look at two verses that teach this idea. Verse 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly, listen to this, shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who, who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, all things that he saw. Now watch verse 3. Blessed is he who reads, and those who hear the words of this prophecy, and keep the things which are written in it. Now don't miss this. For the time is near. John's writing to first century Christians, and he says these things are going to shortly take place. John is writing to a, a family in Asia Minor. Let's say John, a family in the church in Ephesus in Asia Minor receives the book of Revelation, and they read in verse number 3, the time is near. Friend, what good does it offer them? What help does it offer them if that's talking about something a thousand or two thousand years later? The intent of Revelation is within a short time frame of Christians in the first century who are suffering. Let me give you some other verses. Revelation chapter 3, verse number 11. John says, or, or Jesus says it in here, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. Again, the idea of quickly. It's going to happen in a short time frame. Revelation 22, verse 6. Then the angel said to me, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of His holy prophets sent His angel to show His servants things which must shortly take place. Time is near. Shortly take place. Quickly. Again, the idea is shortly going to happen. Revela Listen carefully to me. Revelation itself tells us that the things it's writing about are going to happen in a short time frame that these immediate Christians are living in. The book of Revelation is not about, it's not about things that uh, too many people approach the book of Revelation with an eye toward the present. Read the book of Revelation, and we hear about these signs and wars, and oh, like Matthew 24, we read about this, this dragon, and everybody wants to run and figure out who that dragon is. Friend, that was dealt with in the first century, and Revelation tells us it was going to happen in their time frame. I don't read the book of Revelation looking for some future beast, sea beast, or land beast, or dragon. That's not the idea. It was written to help Christians in the first century and it was going to happen in a short time frame. And so when I read Revelation, I believe it was W.B. West Jr. who in his introduction to the book of Revelation said that we need to read Revelation with our first century glasses on. Friend, that's so true. When I read this book, I need to ask myself, how did that family sitting around the kitchen table in Ephesus who do not know what the next knock on the door might be, the Roman government coming in to take them to prison or even worse, to kill them. How did the book of Revelation apply to them first? It was going to happen in their time frame. What I learn, I learn by application and implication. And so, friend, the book of Revelation, it's not, this is not dealing with Hitler. It's not dealing with Saddam Hussein. It's not dealing with Vladimir Putin. It's not talking about social security numbers or wars of today. Short time frame. The time is mere, quickly going to take place. If I'm going to read the Bible and take what it tells me, I've got to realize this happened in the first century. What I learn is only by application. In fact, all but a few chapters. Chapters 20 through 22 deal with some ideas that are everlasting. That is, or ideas that are still remaining. That's the judgment. That's ideas about heaven and hell. That's ideas about future retribution and future hope, which applied to those Christians, and because time is still standing, applies to us as well today. And so when you see passages in Revelation about Christ's coming shortly, 
or John will say something like, Lord, come quickly, or, or these things are about to quickly take place. Jesus, these are not second coming passages. This is Christ coming in judgment on the evil Roman government, and, and, and this is the desire of these Christians to have their case dealt with before God and vengeance issued to the evil Roman government that is wreaking havoc on them. And so Revelation number 1, 1 King, is written in symbols. Secondly, the majority of Revelation is written about things which would shortly take place in the lifetime of first century Christians. It's not talking about leaders or wars or tribulations that we face today. Key number three, Revelation was given to comfort persecuted Christians. Friend, I want you to think with me about this family. Let's say this family that is in Asia Minor. Let's say we pick the town of Laodicea. And we know the Lord's church existed in Laodicea for Jesus addressed that congregation. I want you to think about Christians in the town of Laodicea. I want you to think about that, that family that loves the Lord deeply who is sacrificing to give to the cause of Christ in their work and their time and their effort, who are doing their best to spread the gospel, but who are living under the oppression of an evil Roman government. How do, the book of Revelation was written to those seven congregations. It was written to give first century Christians who are being persecuted hope and comfort. However I read the book of Revelation, I've got to realize that's what its intent and, it, and its purpose was. Listen to these passages. Revelation chapter 1 verse 9, John says, I, John, your brother and companion in the tribulation and in the kingdom and in the patience of Jesus Christ. John realized these Christians were suffering. Uh, listen to Revelation 6 verse 9. As these Christians who have lost their lives for the cause of Christ cry out, they say, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls, who's those who have been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they hailed. Uh, Revelation 7 Chapter 11, a multiplicity of passages address Christians who are suffering in the first century. And so, friend, a big part of understanding the book of Revelation is that this book was given to comfort persecuted Christians. You remember Revelation 6, verse 9? The souls are under the altar. They're crying out, how long, O oh Lord, faithful and true, until you avenge our bloods? And in essence, God says, hold on just a little while longer. They're given a white robe. They're given an elevated status, at recognizing that God knows what they went through and that things are better for them now. And God says, just hold on a little longer in essence, and I'm going to deal with this problem. And so as we think about the book of Revelation, Christians were suffering greatly during this time frame. They were, you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you read uh, the writings of the patriarchs during to the patriarchal fathers close to the time of that, and you realize the seriousness of it. So they were dragged out of their homes. They were beaten. Some were used to light the gardens of the Caesars. Some were thrown to the lions. Others were murdered and, and their families were disrupted. This was serious times to live in as a Christian. And so God gives the book of Revelation with this purpose in mind. God says He knows their suffering. He cares. And He promises them if they endure, they can win the battle and they can be victorious uh, against all the enemies. And friend, there's a message that bleeds over by practical application today. We live in a world that doesn't often follow God's moral standard. We live in a world that every day it seems like is becoming less and less of a Christian world. In a nation that was once built upon the teaching of one nation under God, we seem to be moving so much further from that. And friend, along with that, as Christians face oppression, as they face uh, uh, people mocking them, as they in the future may have to deal with persecution and maybe even once again having to fend for their own lives. 
Isn't it good to know if we endure the battle, we also will be victorious? Revelation 14, verse 13, the Bible says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. And don't you remember the words of Romans 8, 18? Paul said, I consider the sufferings of this present time. They're not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so, my friend, as we've thought today, about these first three keys in the book of Revelation, that it's written in signs and symbols, that it's written about things which would shortly take place, and that the book is specifically written to comfort persecuted Christians. Doesn't that show us the love, the care, and the concern that God has and always will have for His people? Friend, we want you to know today, as we think about these ideas, that we love you, and that the God of heaven loves you deeply. He loves you so much. He gave His only begotten Son so that you could have the hope of eternal life. John 3, 16. No matter what we face, no matter what we deal with, Christians have something to look forward to. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Friend, we have the hope of heaven. We have the joy of God being with us here and, and the encouragement of other Christians. We have everything we need to be right with God. If you're not a child of God, we hope today that you've thought about how much God loves His people, and we hope that if you're not a child of God, you'll become one. Do you believe that Jesus is God's Son, the Savior of the world? Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. Having believed in Christ, would you be willing to turn to Him from a life of sin and repentance? Luke chapter 13, verse 3. Would you make that great confession? I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that leads to salvation, Romans 10, verse 10. Would you, as, a, as one who wants to obey God and do His will, having confessed Jesus, would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. We're so glad you joined us again today for our study, and we hope you'll join us next time as we present more information to understand the book of Revelation. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.